Murray Sunset National Park, second only to the Alpine National Park for size. Wait, hang on a minute, we've got a bit of a problem here. The differential pressure sensor on the fuel filter is reporting that the fuel filter is getting blocked. Not wanting to head into a remote area with a warning light on the dashboard, we stopped for lunch then went back a little way to Bendigo to pick up a new one and a spare. Undo three bolts, they say, but in typical mechanical fashion, one of them is stripped. Fortunately, a reverse spline screw extractor took care of it and then the bolt was replaced. Reprime the fuel system and we're going again. Now, uh, where was I? So next up, top off the tanks at Underball and then proceed into Murray Sunset itself. Anyway, it's one of the few remaining untouched semi-arid areas in Australia, and although it's not exactly remote enough to be considered outback, it's certainly that way in terms of weather and appearance. If Victoria has an outback, then this is it. So yeah, the Kathmandu hat is out, and it's all frill neck now, because that hat just, the brim just wasn't long enough to actually cover the gap at the top of my neck with the t-shirt, so I got sunburnt there a few times. We've got a largely unplanned trip, but we're planning to take a big lap of the park in a few days, then check out the other parks nearby. First thing was a walk around Lake Hardy. This is the pinkest of the pink lakes, but they typically only achieve their pink colour after late summer when the peak algae level is reached. Then it was a quick trip down the road past Lake Crosby to the similar but larger Lake Becking. So do you reckon it's pinker than the other one? It is said during this time it would take longer to clear the tracks of the windblown sand than to actually harvest the salt. The engine apparently even caught fire on the maiden journey. Long before this area was a national park, there was a thriving local industry in mining these lakes for salt. A lot of transport methods tried, some not so successful. It's a bit of a breeze. Two jointed stems and a very hard surface to restrict movement of water from the plant during the summer heat. So the plus side if we pick this campsite is we get it to ourselves, I bet. The minus side is it kind of sucks. Preferring the Lake Crosby site because it's actually located in sight of the lake, we headed back there to set up camp for the night. Screwing tent pegs are good here because the ground is very hard. And I've now got a fuel filter that stinks of diesel. We'll keep it inside the spare tire, that way it's not in the car. Nope, the diesel ate through the bag, soaked through the box, then ate through the bag the box was in. An alternative method of disposal was devised. I got out the fan, but it's actually started being really windy now. So, it's a nice pleasant change. Assume that 4k walk is all flat because everything around here is flat. No, they constructed a staircase just for you. So do you want to get up at around sunrise and... Yeah, I guess. The Klein Loop Nature Walk loops around Lake Crosby and Lake Kenyon, also passing through areas of much more varied foliage. Overall, it's more varied than the other walks, crossing plains with trees and grass rather than just circling a salt lake. There were also more hills than expected, but it's important to get this one out of the way before it starts getting hot, as it's a much longer walk than the other two. Along this walk, there's also more remnants of the salt mining past. An entire car for one, but there's a small museum of mining machinery and a salt-covered rock. Back to Lake Crosby to have breakfast, pack up camp and prepare to head on. Primary advantage of a swag is unlike a tent, you can leave all the bedding in there when you roll it up, whereas if you try to pack up your tent with all the bedding still in it, well, you're not going to have a very fun time.
Everything so far has been accessible to normal vehicles, but here we head up to Mount Crozier track and this is where the four-wheel drive bit begins. The initial bits are almost deceptively easy, barely different from what came before, but don't worry, you'll soon find the sand. Mount Crozier campground is the first stop. It's quite a large campground with a toilet and water tank, but we're here for the short walk up Mount Crozier. Uh oh, it's got stairs. I said it was short, I didn't say it wasn't steep. With how flat this area is, it doesn't take much elevation to see quite a long way, but it was certainly starting to heat up already, so it was back to the car. From here, the sand gets deeper, the track gets rougher, and the day gets hotter. At this point, we were two campsites on at Underball. We considered going back to the Mount Crozier campground, but the thing was, it was only 10am, not really time to set up camp for the night. But the other thing was, though, that the next campground was a long way away. But we did have all day to get there. At this point, something we noticed was that there weren't really a lot of tyre tracks around here that weren't ours. Those that were there had been there for a while. Yeah, I think I need, I think those either need to be safety wired or lock tighted in. After having lunch at Underbull Track Campground, which unlike preceding ones is little more than a clearing off the side of the road, we proceeded on. Track quality varies a bit but generally gets worse as you go west, with more undulation, steeper climbs and deeper sand. Okay, someone is having a small dispute with Parks Vic over the number of rock holes and their plurality. Ah, right. Okay, we willingly walked over to that. In my opinion, that's more something that you should have a sign to warn you away from, but whatever. It's around here that the sand gets especially bad, and then... Continuing up the border track which skirts the border of SA and Victoria, this section being on the Victorian side, we soon reached the border camping area. The border campground is quite open, large, flat, and is a rather nice place to stay even if it lacks any facilities. This stands in stark contrast to the border track which is narrow, hilly, and covered in sand even deeper than the sunset track we've been driving across Murray Sunset on. It was about 38 degrees at this point in the day, so there was really nothing to do except wait for the sun to go down and for things to get a bit cooler. But when the sun came down, the wind came in. A lot of wind. Okay, I understand you're mobile, uh, Michaela. And, uh, well, yeah, you're just about a perfect copy. I'm missing the odd syllable, so it's been a big problem. The concept of an egg protector seems like one of those crazy bits of camping gear sold primarily to people who have never been camping. But it's almost inevitable that the eggs in the carton end up on the bottom of the fridge, and then get cracked. And then you've got to clean your whole fridge out. Pro 
pro tip, the last thing you should do before this gets packed up, always, is to refill every water bottle you have from it. Because it's really inconvenient to get it out again. And you're just being difficult. <laughs> Clay mud. You're glad we lowered tire pressure. <laughs> Heading north, track quality is a bit better in this section, if a little corrugated. From sunset to sunrise. Oh, just from sunset to sunrise, 6 to 10th of December. Well, as it's the 25th of December and it's not after sunset, I think we're good. Having found a solution to avoiding the smell of a pit toilet on a hot day, we went to take a look at the Shearer's quarters. The existing Shearer's hut is thought to have been built in the period between 1958 to 1962 at a cost of £500. Originally the interior walls were made of tar paper and horsehair reinforced fibre sheet but they have since been removed. Oh good, not asbestos. In 1991 Murray Sunset National Park was declared. In 1995, following extensive re renovations, the hut was opened to the public for accommodation. Up here there's a walk that goes around the local area that we took, although by this point in the day it was quite hot already. You're right, I can notice evidence of widespread logging. red dirt and the blue sky. Definitely looking quite out back here in spirit if not reality. So, obviously untreated rainwater do not drink, but we've got a little secret weapon. MSR Guardian water purifier has a ceramic microfilter which can filter out everything right down to viruses. This entire operation runs on water and diesel, and it's critical not to run out of either. Having obtained another 20 litres of safe drinking water, we were good to go. So we headed on to the south, before heading east down Feeney's Track, where we stopped for lunch at Feeney's Track camping area. Having a toilet that has more than underball. Well, it wasn't really a proper lunch. We weren't hungry and it was too hot to do much. Feeney's trek was a lot more solid, being well graded clay instead of loose sand. We headed east down here towards Rocket Lake, but getting there would require a detour via Underbull Trek first. As we headed further east, the flora changed remarkably from low scrub and bushes to trees which grew much taller. In general, everything just looked a whole lot greener, representing how much more water there was on this side of the park. Not that there really was a lot. We reached Rocket Lake Campground, which would have been greatly improved by the provision of literally any shade whatsoever. Lunch at Rocket Lake, and then we picked our way south from there to Mopoke Hut. The sand got quite a bit heavier to the south in this section, reminiscent of parts of the Sunset Track. Mm -hmm. 
Mopo Cut was built by Alan Henschke, so he had somewhere to stay after driving cattle down by horse from his property Yaramba, so he didn't have to carry all his camping gear here as well. After stock grazing was phased out as the area became a national park, the lease was handed back, but he insisted the hut stayed for the use of visitors. Sadly, the hut was vandalised in 1991, but the Mildura 4x4 club stepped in to rebuild it, and it's remained here ever since. JPEG subsampling. Yeah. Like 4x4x4. Really good lighting here, but... that'll strengthen your faith and provide a solid defense against spiritual attack. On Friday and Saturday, and Buckingham Palace has raised a picture of Queen Elizabeth delivering her to go. Well, what happened to the shelter, you might ask? Well, the thing was, when it got cold last night, it started blowing an absolute gale. The wind was trying to dismantle the shelter, and it was trying very hard, so we had to take it down. Um, unfortunately, also, the blowing wind brought with it a ton of sand, so now the swag's full of sand, and we'll have to shake that out. We headed on from here to an area known as the Rack Plain, which contains gypsum clay and salinas, pools of salty water mainly fed through groundwater, not rain. This was not what you call a particularly good track, but it certainly was an interesting one. And then we found... The Thing. There used to be a railway line out here, and gypsum mined here would be loaded onto trains using it. Brunswick Plaster Mills operated the railway to transport this gypsum to the Victorian Railways Interchange siding at Nowingi. Okay, so where we're heading is a campsite that's not even on this map. Okay, so there's a reason that campsite doesn't exist on the map anymore. It's got one barely remaining bench and a small clearing for a single camp. So then we headed south through the middle of the Rack Plain area back to the Nowingi line track. This area was vastly different, being significantly greener than anything we'd seen around here before. But now it's back to the Nowingi line and out of the park. The Nowingi line leaves the park crossing farmland, so there's a few gates to open and close again, but there's still a few things to see. This tanker truck was used to refuel the previously mentioned gypsum train, and it hit a patch of uneven ground, rolling over. The driver escaped shortly before it caught fire. We pull over just before the highway to raise tyre pressure and see the first other people we've seen in days. Join us on our next adventure where we head to the Hatta National Park. 
which although it's just on the other side of this road, is worlds apart in environment.